All right, let's bring out the cast and creatives of Better Call Saul. He's a calculating criminal with big dreams. Michael Mando plays Nacho. He's the best dressed man on the show, though I'm not sure there's that much competition. Patrick Fabian plays Howard Hamlin. We need to get this woman out of doc review. Ray Seharn plays Kim Wexler. He left his space blanket at home. Michael McKean plays Chuck. <laughs> He goes by many different names. Gene from Cinnabon, Slipping Jimmy, Saul Goodman, but now he's playing Jimmy McGill, Bob Odenkirk. He's one half of the creative geniuses behind it. Peter Gould, one of the executive producers. And his partner in crime, Vince Gilligan. Well, hello, everybody. Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you guys doing? You going to look at your internet while we talk? No, these are my questions. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Candy Crush. She's on IMDb. I'm on oh, IMDb. Who's that? I'm playing Tetris. <laughs> so I've got so many questions about that episode, but we've got to start with that last moment. When did you guys decide that you're bringing Tio back? When did we decide we'll bring Tio back? Uh, probably right before, uh, right as we were breaking this episode. Yeah. I think we thought, you know, Tuco's in trouble. Who's he going to call? Mm -hmm. Uncle Tio. Uncle, uncle, uncle. Uncle Tio. Uncle, uncle. <laughs> uncle. <laughs> uncle, uncle. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Walking Tio. Yeah. I was watching you guys watch that episode backstage. What did it mean to you to see him back on stage, on that set? It was, it was awesome having him back. I mean, Mark Margolis is the sweetest guy in the world, and uh, he's it, it, very unlike his character that he plays. And uh, he kills I, almost no people. <laughs> <laughs> See? Yeah. What was it like? Uh, what was it like? Because uh, we weren't there. Oh, I hate man. to say. What was it like being? Uh, uh, wait a minute. You. You. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, I was in a van with them going to set. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I was saying, yeah, Jonathan. I wish Jonathan were up here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, um, Jonathan couldn't be with us. But Bob, I was watching your reaction to that moment. I mean. Well, part of it is I can't remember what happens in these episodes until I watch them. I mean, it's kind of fun for me, but there's so much that we're doing during the season, and I'm always thinking about the next scene. I kind of I lose track of how the story plays out. And uh, the fun of that is I get to watch it again. And so that blows my mind. <laughs> like, I didn't even know. Like, it reminds me, oh, right, remember that show you were in? <laughs> <laughs> When it blew your mind the first time, so it's really, I get to experience it again. It's awesome, but um, it's just amazing, right? How'd you feel when you saw that? <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah. And, then, and, then, and then you right away start doing the math, right? You go like, wait, is that, can't, oh, yeah, he's still alive. Well, how come he's not, he's not hurt yet? Okay, right, I when, wonder when he gets hurt, and it's so, <laughs> you know what I mean? You just start trying to put that world back together. And it's just a great feeling. And never done uh, for, uh, never done except for good reason by these guys. Didn't he pitch you a cooking show in the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, Mark pitched um, Better Call Slaw, a cooking show in the band. <laughs> 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 that was my first introduction to Better Call Slaw. That's yeah, what it was. Yeah, Very nice. <laughs> That's good. Like, we got to work on that. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, Ray, I have to ask you about your scene with the post-its. Talk about filming that scene. That was a fantastic montage. Great. Um, I have to thank all the props people. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Matt, Trina, um, all of those guys. Uh, Rob, they're so great. Um, that was great. We, we spent a day doing, um, I guess it was nine, nine or ten phone calls, and then a bunch of um, pocket dialogue, which is just uh, additional uh, text. To, uh, that you act in full performance mode, but um, that they may or may not use, dip in and out of music and silence, as you guys saw, and then Kelly Dixon edited it. So amazing. And that's, that's the first time I got to see 
the whole thing put together that way to show this passage of time and um, and everything she's going through. And it was it was a blast. And I, I love I love the way it came out. I love how disconcerting it is um, and how character driven it is. And uh, it was fun. It was fun. A lot of uh, the devil was in the details with all of those things, though color coding and which post it was which and whose name was which. And um, it was just it was fun. It was fun to really play out Kim's journey in this one. And Michael, we also got to learn a little bit about Chuck's backstory. How much fun was that for you to explore? Well, I think it's fun that people don't know whether I'm telling the absolute truth or not. I think I probably <coughs> am, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice to see little, uh, actually there are two different uh, thumbnail sketches of Jimmy in this show. There's one we're seeing with our own eyes at the dinner table in the beginning, and there's one in this anecdote, in this story that is kind of a cautionary tale. Now, I might have my own reasons for cautioning this person, and I might be coloring it one way or another, but I, it, was, it was very interesting. Very interesting, and I've never asked you or not whether it was true, right? I don't think you no. did. That. Okay, don't tell me. No, no. I'm gonna ask: Is it true? <laughs> Let's you just say it was really fun to play. Well, you want to take this? Well, I, don't, Peter, I, is it true? I think it's. I think it's too be too soon to tell. I mean, who knows what we're gonna? Who knows what we might see? We don't know. paint ourselves in any corners unduly. That's too, right. Too quickly. I, you know, no. I think we can go out on a limb and say I think it's. I, I think that I, I, you know, I think it's true to him. I think it's. I think he's. Yeah. Yeah. I. I don't think that's a stretch to say that that uh, the story he's telling this young woman uh, is a cautionary tale that that uh, that he believes. Whether or not it's strictly true, uh, we may glean from later episodes. We may not. Uh, not to nail that down too much. But. To me, part of the there's a tragedy, which is that these two brothers, for all. For everything that's going on between them, they love each other, but they truly don't understand each other. There's, on a fundamental way, Jimmy doesn't understand Chuck, and Chuck sure as hell doesn't understand Jimmy. And it's, it's a, um, there's a, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 I, it is, uh, it's, it's funny, <laughs> but it's, it's also, it's, it's, you know, in some ways, these two are clinging to each other. Uh, th there aren't that many. People, not, them, not that much family in their lives, and yet there's, they're, they're not quite connected. And uh, we're going to explore a lot more of that, too. And I guess the question, too, for Ray, does Kim believe the story? It's a good question. I mean, and I think that for me, more important than whether, or not, and I didn't ask if it was true or not, um, because they won't ever answer you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, um, it's because I thought the most important thing was that everyone is living by their own version of their truth. And she believes in that moment that is, this is what Chuck believes is the truth. I think Kim has probably heard versions of the story that are told through Jimmy's point of view. And, um, and she doesn't know what the truth is, but the point is people are um, developing their lives and shaping their morals and ethics and who they are based on these truths. And, and memory is not fact, um, and feelings aren't fact, and they're basing them on this. And what she has really come there to ask is, can you please tell me if I'm not, if I have a place and a career here and a chance to be judged, um, you know, by a meritocracy instead of being a pawn? And this is the answer I get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so there's a lot of stuff going on with her there. Um, and uh, I, I think I tried to. We had a great time playing the scene. And um, and Michael's an incredible, incredibly generous actor who reminded me rightfully so that it's never a monologue, it's a scene, and, and it's just as much about what Kim is choosing not, not to say and not to help or abet in that moment. Also, Ray played her side of things, keeping everything uphill for me. I mean, if, if, if we had reached a moment halfway through that when Kim says, ah, oh, damn it, you're right, I'm out of here, <laughs> or, or, some, or, or you know, I'm never gonna speak to Jimmy again, whatever those were, but I didn't get any, any breaks like that. I, no. I kept trying to read you, and or Chuck kept trying to read Kim. Right. And Kim was just not, she wasn't home. It's just she wasn't answering the door. It, yes, and it was important to me to not be complicitous in throwing yeah. Jimmy under the bus. I won't, I won't do it. Even if she thought it was 100% true, I will, I will not do that to him. I, I really think she must be a really good lawyer because she knows how, yeah. to, she knows yeah. how to have a poker face. Exactly. Yeah, she's, yeah she, she would be better at poker than me, for yeah. sure. <laughs> 
this season has very much been about Kim and Jimmy's relationship. I mean, it's, and it seems like it's in a dangerous place right now. She does say that she's still seeing somebody. Is their relationship okay? Can it be saved? Vincent Peter, do you want to answer that? I think she's, uh, oh, and by the way, before we get too far, uh, I want to say, I want to give a shout out to Ann Shurkus, who wrote this episode, yes. who I think is here. She's here somewhere. Stand up and say, uh, give a wave if you're here, Ann. Where is she? Is she here? Right, there. right over there. There she hey, is. There she is. Right there. And that was her first stand episode up, for up. us. That's right. Stand, stand up. up. Stand up. Scheiben, who directed the episode, stand up. Yeah, I see him there. Yes. Woo! Yeah. I don't know if, if Kelly Dixon's there. Kelly, who edited it. I don't Yay. know. Yay! Always, always give Kelly. Kelly did a great job cutting. But I just wanted to didn't want to get too far uh, without uh, giving a shout out to those folks. The question: What was the question? Right, how is their relationship? What's the state I of their think relationship? it's. Uh, uh, yeah. Tenuous and a, <laughs> well, here's the thing. I was saying out the front earlier, we, we had a lot of nice folks, uh, the press folks asking us questions about, you know, when are they going to have a happy ending? Are they going to have a happy ending? And, I'm, and, and uh, we want happy endings in our lives, but there is a reason. I'm using the same quote I used. Uh, That's good. Little, but but, but it's, there's a reason the fairy tale ends with, and they lived hap happily ever after. And there's a reason you never see that part, because it's boring. That's the boring part. <laughs> It's what we want. It's a funny irony. It's what we want in our real lives. It's not what we want in our drama. And I call this a drama. There's as much comedy and, and, and purposely so as drama in this show. But we want, we want to see the struggle. We want to see the uphill climb. We want to see the rolling the rock up the up the mountain. And so I, I, I suspect uh, if Breaking Bad is any guide, and if uh, the first two seasons, first season and a half that you've seen is Better Call Saul or any guide, that uh, uh, difficulties will will continue. But it doesn't mean that they don't care for each other and love each other. So can I say that without being a spoiler alert? Difficulties will continue. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for ruining it. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped watching after that. <laughs> Just want to see him be happy for another 40 episodes. <laughs> yeah. Well. Got more law done today. How are you, Scott? <laughs> Feeling great. It's good to have you back aboard, Jimmy. <laughs> Bob, it does seem what's motivating Jimmy this season is his love or his desire for a relationship with Kim. Desire? <laughs> I think he's doing pretty good, man. <laughs> we had a scene in bed eating pie. You did, indeed. I don't think it gets any better. <laughs> Come on. Who doesn't like pie? Mm. <laughs> but can he win her By back? By the way, they should raffle that off. You get to eat a pie on a bed with Ray Seahorn. <laughs> very weird. But sitting in For charity, for charity. Right. For charity. <laughs> charity. Come on. Help the kids. Help the children. Sure. Think of them. <laughs> Don't think of yourself. The Marie Callender Foundation. <laughs> For every pie you eat, we donate one pie <laughs> to Orbit. <laughs> All right. Very That's answer. a good Mr. Show sketch. Let's uh, carry on. <laughs> I, I need to generate more comedy while I'm here uh, to justify it. Uh, OK, what was the question? I think he's doing pretty good. I I'm think fine. Jimmy and Kim are doing pretty good. They got a, they, you know, it's rough. Everything, I'm married for 19 years. It's rough every day. Come on, it doesn't ever get easy or great. Except your wedding day's pretty good. The day after, the night of, that's the good one. <laughs> that's the one time you gave her everything she wanted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, listen. I knew this wasn't going to be easy. What about his relationship with Chuck? That seems a little bit more fraught. Well, you know what I like about what these gentlemen have done is that first season ended and you sort of felt like it was clean slate. But you know, with family, it's never clean slate. And you know, you even if you have family members you haven't spoken to in a long, long time, they're still kind of present in your life. And they're just, they really are. 
and that's a weird thing. So I, a weird phenomenon that doesn't really happen in any other way with any other kind of person in the world, I think. So they stay, that, that's a true thing that Jimmy, and he lives in the same town and he's in the same business and uh, so he's going to continue to see Chuck and their complicated relationship is going to continue to try to sort itself out. So um, it's not easy. Chuck's not easy. Oh, well. <laughs> but they're still, you know, interacting because they're brothers and Chuck has a condition, which Jimmy has sympathy for his brother. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I love... I love continuing to explore it, as challenging and as it is. I hear difficulties. We'll yeah, it sounds like difficulties will arise. And what's your side really? of it? What, uh, what's your side of it? Sorry? Michael, what, what's your, what, side, what's your oh. side of that, uh, what he just said? I completely disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's, no, pretty I, hard on, he's pretty hard on Jimmy. Well, all, all sibling relationships are, uh, are a little bit complicated. But I think when there's a, 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 a large age gap between the two brothers, I, I mean, I was getting out of law school when he was still screwing up in high school. And he continued the screwing up well afterwards, and he became my responsibility. Our absent father, we saw, we saw tonight, we, we, we saw dad's fate, um, and uh, perhaps Jimmy's at least spiritual complicity in that, but that's debatable. Um, <laughs> but still, uh, the fact that there is this, this, this stretch of, uh, of years between them, and uh, here you saw, me, saw the married couple here, and the very settled, very happy Dupras, all those Kurt Vonnegut fans out there, the, you know, we, we were two, right? and this is right. the third wheel, the, the classic third wheel, the brother-in-law, the screw-up, the guy who shows up with some beer when we have a, you know, 40-year-old bottle of wine to uncork. Um, and, you know, it, I, I kind of undersell him, I think. And he does, he is a hit. He is a hit with my wife. And that's another nail in his coffin as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, yeah, Chuck, Chuck is difficult. But Jimmy is too. They're just two different kinds of difficult. But in the world we now exist in, the wife is no longer around. What can we read into that? Well, I don't know yet. <laughs> Vincent Peter? She, li she likes electricity. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if, you're, if your significant other said it's me or electricity. <laughs> <laughs> I think that pretty much nailed it. Yeah, yeah, Fair enough. You, can't top that. you know, is it safe to say how little we know about the future of this? I think it's very safe to say. I mean, is this yeah. something we should say publicly? I mean, <laughs> yes, it's safe to say publicly. <laughs> this is just between us. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think so, it's so, okay. I think we only it's have okay. a few people here. We're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, you're not in danger of being replaced. <laughs> <laughs> we, we uh, and we did this on, on, on Breaking Bad as well, we, um, we, we give ourselves outs as often as we can. We, we, uh, we, we try, it looks like, especially back on Breaking Bad and probably on this show as well, it looks like we, we enjoy painting ourselves in the corners, and we kind of do, but we always kind of uh, give ourselves out. Uh, it's, uh, suffice it to say, it's important to us to know that she's no longer around, that Rebecca, uh, this episode is named Rebecca, uh, is no longer around. I don't, if, uh, if you held a gun to her heads right now, I'm not sure we could tell you exactly why she's not, but uh, we, we know that she's not, and, and we like to... We leave ourselves room to maneuver in the writer's room. That's true. I, for me, it's also a little bit of understanding Chuck just a, a tiny bit, because here's a man who obviously did have this, there was, a, there was a real relationship there. And when you see these two together, you see that there is, there's a real marriage there. And he's lost that. He's living alone in a house with no electricity. He's, he's working by lantern light. And, He's in solitary. He's yeah, and it's it, I, to me, I, I I really feel bad for him. I think I think he's it, sometimes we we think of Chuck as being the bad guy or the more successful brother, but he's not really. What kind of success is it if you end up living by yourself in a, in a with a with a space blanket and uh, 
a space blanket and a, and a cooler with some uh, with some bacon floating in it and and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 okay. a, and a lantern. I mean, it's it's in his own. You know, it really reminds. Mom, I'm doing great. <laughs> I got a bacon floating in a cooler and I got a lantern. But there's no phone there. But. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Now he prays. <laughs> it also worries me that Kim Wexler doesn't exist in Saul Goodman's world. Well, well, just because we never saw her in Breaking Bad doesn't mean she doesn't exist in that world. Yes, Deborah. Okay. <laughs> and Fair some enough. people didn't tweet that. They're like, I'm afraid to like Kim because she's dead. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> someone the other night and I was just saying she's happily you know running her own life and they were like she's dead I'm like she's fine wow. <laughs> I, I was defending know. you you yeah, know I, anybody I, you don't see is just dead that's that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's what I said I was like and even if she even if she existed and you know and they and the Breaking Bad years we saw any of those scenes in a Rashomon effect from other points of view if she was in Jimmy's life and important to him would he bring her up to Heisenberg? By the way, there's someone I care deeply about. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you should know about her. Like, I, just, no, I feel like all possibilities are open, and I refuse to hear otherwise. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. All right, so Mr. Hamlin, when are we getting her out of Dockerview? She got herself into Dockerview. <laughs> You know, it's a tough ship to run over there at HHM. Um, <laughs> How sad was the scene when he says no to me and I'm standing there with the flag by myself? Beautiful shot. What is that? Well, I, you know, I, 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 think, I think she earned her way right in Doc Review and uh, she will earn her way out. But just, you know, one good deed doesn't necessarily make it, make it turn like that. I don't know, you know, it, I, I heard people like boo and I'm like, boo, I'm running a company for that. <laughs> You know, my, my partner at arms is in a space blanket, right? <laughs> the other kid I put my chips on, he's a moron, you know? And, and he's dragging her down. So who do I got left? Nacho? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, God forbid I run into him in the show, you know? So, uh, I don't know. I want to see those guys team up. You know, I, I, I want to say, I know everybody feels the same way. Thank you all for coming yes. today. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's so Thank great you, to see you guys. I know a lot of you have traveled. I know some, I, uh, some, I think Sarah Stewart, I think from Twitter, from Ohio. Aww. Where are you? There she is. Right ah. over there. Yeah. Sarah, has, Sarah yeah. tweets a lot, very well. Sarah tweets, a, she has a. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up, absolutely. Stand up. has a, a gathering every week and they have Cinnabons and uh, they oh, watch the show. Nice. Last week they made a strawberry squat cobbler. Yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> so that's the kind of fans we have and I really want to thank you for making it all the way from Ohio. Absolutely. Wow. Who had the honor of sitting in it? <laughs> <laughs> Did it raffle that off? That'd be good. Awesome. So speaking of squat cobbler, how did you ever come up with that idea? Right what you right. know. <laughs> The heart wants what it wants. <laughs> yeah. How great is Mark Brooks? Yeah. Oh, man. Mark Brooks. Mark Brooks is uh, right. So great. Where, where so did we good. come up with that? Where, where, where did that come from? Well, you know, um, Jennifer Hutchinson wrote a great episode two, which is 201. She's uh, 202. She she's, might be she's here. one of our, maybe she's here. Jenny, Jen are you here? here? No, nah, she's not. She's, she's, she's got other things to do. Uh, <laughs> But she, she's a wonderful writer, and, and she actually started uh, as uh, Vince's assistant on Breaking Bad, but now she's, she's one of our produ go-to producers and go-to writers. She wrote a great script, but I think in the, in the room, we had never thought about giving this, we just say, oh, he sticks in pies. And, and, that was, and I think that was in the script, and tell me if, if you remember it the same way, it was in the script more or less that Jimmy said, well, he sits in pies. And then uh, we were actually, it was the first day, first day of episode, uh, of, the, of the first episode, and Bob had just read the second episode, and you said something like, I love the episode, it's great. I, it just occurred to me that these things usually have a name. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, like a Chicago sunroof. Right, right. Uh, and, right. And, and in, our, in our quest. There's to, always a name, and you right. hear it, and you go, you don't want to look stupid, right? Yeah. The person who hears yeah. it is like, yeah, I know about that. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
it's the thing that makes you go, I don't know. There's so many of them, and I don't know what any of them mean. <laughs> but uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's that, that thing. It makes it real, too. Yeah. Wow. That, was a great, that was a great note. Anyway. Great touch. Well, but you Jennifer, guys came up with the great names, so many of them. It was, it was, and it was a group effort, Jennifer, uh, who's a, a wonderful writer. And, and, but, you know, it, it's, yeah. We, we, I don't, the, the weird thing is you don't remember where any of this stuff comes from. So you, I don't anyway. Afterwards, you, you no. made it up. You didn't just type into Google what is it called when you. <laughs> oh, no, Squat Cobbler. That was a, a uh, it's Hoboken. It's a Hoboken. It's a Hoboken. Squad Squad. Let's not skip over Hoboken. But <laughs> has a great many names apparently. That's true. Uh, uh, Simple Simon the Ass Man. Dutch, <laughs> Dutch Apple Ass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, no. It's that's the fun part of being collectively. I think I see a bunch of our writers. Uh, hey, our writer, the, the writers that did show up. You guys stand up. I see Gordon Smith. Yes. I see, uh, stand up there, Gordon. We got his band. Who else? Everybody else. That was it. That was it. Okay. Thomas Snow over there. There's one. Oh, Thomas Snow. Thomas Snow. Thomas Tom, Tom over there, one of my oldest friends, he uh, wrote and directed the first episode of this season, uh, the opening uh, episode uh, with, with Jimmy floating in the pool, and uh, so he's a great director as well. And, uh, but you, you, don't, you never remember in hindsight, well, I don't, I, I can't speak for all the other wonderful writers, uh, for the, uh, but I, yeah, I don't remember where the ideas come from, they just sort of come. Yeah. No. Bob's right, though. People pretend they know. I watched the Squat Cobbler episode, which I believe is just called Cobbler, <laughs> but um, on the, uh, with like five people. I'm the girlfriend of a friend that was there who is always very cool, because um, Graham, my fiance, is watching it, and it's fun also watching it dawn on somebody what Jimmy is describing. He's like, Squat Cobbler, and this one girl did, in fact, oh, she goes, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 That's good. I love that. I like it. <laughs> so, Michael Mando, let's talk a little bit about Nacho. He's really coming to his own this season. <laughs> talk about exploring his backstory. Well, I'm usually behind the plants whenever these guys are talking <laughs> <laughs> and listening in. No, but it's been it's been really a, an amazing experience and. Um, I just feel so lucky to be part of this show and working with these great people. And uh, yeah, a lot of roller coaster stuff coming up. <laughs> yeah, that's true. How great is it that we got to meet Nacho's family? Absolutely. Talk yeah. about that. Yeah. 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 I what love that. show where you've got a bad guy who's kind of so purely scary, then do you get to meet him with his dad standing yeah. there? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I that's, know. A, yep. that's a kind of a texture that. You don't get on every These show. guys do, and it's so great to get to play that. I mean, when you're standing there with Mike, yeah. and then your father is right there, and yeah. here's, it, people often ask me about Saul versus Jimmy, and I go, well, Saul was just a, a persona. He was just like a facade that this guy was playing, and he tells Walter White when he first meets him, I'm not, that's not my name and all that. It's all a show. <laughs> But now, Jimmy, you see with his brother, you see with a girl he loves, you see him alone, you, you know, and we're all different people in these different places in, and different sort of formulas of our life. And then to take a character like Nacho and see him with his dad, you would never predict that that, but he's, every character's got a family, right? I yeah. mean, if it's a And how world. morally sound his father is, too. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, he's one of the most yeah. moral people on the show. He, yeah. wouldn't, he wouldn't upsell a client, and he would turn down business for the sake of someone uh, saving money. So that's really, really, who wrote this? <laughs> 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 Who's this Vince and Peter guy? No, but it's great, it's great to get to play it. As Absolutely, an actor, it's, it's a people, real treat. When you look at a script, I'm always looking to see if there's, and these guys kind of taught me that, is what's great <coughs> about a role. Well, what's great about a role is if there's just another dimension to it that reveals itself. Oh, yeah. It doesn't have to be the big role of the piece, but if you as an actor get to play a certain character, but then at some point in the show, there's just a depth presented or shows itself. That becomes rewarding. Oh, absolutely. I, I was so lucky in the first season not to be in it that much. 
Because I, I, I'm serious. I looked at it as like doing your free education in cinema. I'd show up every day on set and I'd watch these wonderful people work. I got to read the scripts. I recommend any film, aspiring filmmakers or writers to read these guys' scripts and the way they break down character and everything. But to be fair, Michael would then cry in the corner. Yes. <laughs> I would go on hikes with Bob and say, what's going on? But that was He'd claw my dressing room door. Yeah. Let me in, let me in. Michael, me in. I, I, I know we talked about it. You talked about it a little. Yeah. The scene with uh, Mike and your character's father, that, that was a, a scene you had to take apart. Yeah, it, 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 it was tough because um, with Nacho, like especially in the last season written by Gordon Smith, episode four, who's out there in the audience, he did such a wonderful job, but it was tough because for the first time, we get to see a character who's very, very guarded start to reveal layers of himself and come out of this sort of persona of being a gangster and into being a human being. And how do you deal with that? And how do you show um, like you say, who he, who is he behind that mask? Yeah. And that was extremely fun to play, and I feel very happy to have done it. It was also the very long scene you had with Mike, where you're setting him up for what you want him to do. Right, yeah. that was a great scene. And, and it was a it was a lengthy scene, and it was a scene that was primarily an expository scene. Yeah. But it never felt like that. It was just a beautifully played scene. Oh, thank you it so much. Gordon Smith wrote that. He wrote Five O. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely, and, and it feels really, really exciting. And um, to be in a show that you're, you're, you're a fan of your character, you're a fan of the show, but you're also a fan of everybody you're working with, and to have such an amazing, amazing fan base that is so supporting, so intelligent, and so involved, um, I think we all feel a sense of responsibility to give everything we've got to make you guys happy every Monday. Wow. Patrick is running for office. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that Jimmy is eventually going to become Saul Goodman. So how do you pace that storytelling out? How do you manage the pace of the storytelling? Oh, man, that's, that's, that's the hardest part. And, and the interesting thing is, uh, I mean, this is something we, we, we wonder about all the time, wouldn't you say? The interesting thing to us is, uh, I mean, the show is called Better Call Saul. And in season... <laughs> Early season one, I, I'll speak for myself, I was very nervous that people were going to, I was saying all the time in the room uh, to, to you and the, and the other writers, you know, we, better, we better get cracking here. We better get to Saul Goodman because that's what people, if people tune in, the, the safe assumption is that's who they're tuning in to see. Yeah, if, if you call the show Batman, you don't expect it to be all about Bruce Wayne. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then we were, I, I we were both nervous about it, and then we thought, well, then, you know, at the end, after the end of season one, then season two, he'll pretty quickly become Saul Goodman. Yeah. But no. So the answer, the answer, how do you pace it out is... One step at a time. One step at a time. There's no, you know, it's, it's because it, we, you know, there's no, uh, I hate to say it, there's no master plan. Uh, <laughs> other, than we, to, other than to be interesting. Other, we, although we do, I mean, the thing is, though, we do know a lot. We know a lot. We know how Saul Goodman dresses. Mm -hmm. We know we know how he expresses himself. We know the things he's willing to do, and we also know who Jimmy McGill is, and we know how Jimmy dresses, thinks, expresses himself, and what Jimmy's <coughs> not willing to do. Yeah. And so we do. We kind of have these endpoints, but how we get from how we get from from New York to L.A. is 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 a big question. I mean, sometimes we talk about it as being like the Transcontinental Railroad, and you know we built. <laughs> We built half of it on Breaking Bad, and now here we are starting from the west, going, going back east, and you kind of hope that you don't end up like three states apart. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want two sets of tracks lining up like this at the end. No, <laughs> it could happen, though. I was I so mean, that surprised would be the big, that you don't that, write a Bible. I was so surprised that you guys don't write a whole Bible on Breaking Bad, too. And if you guys don't listen to Kelly Dixon's podcast, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah right. Kelly Dixon. Willingness to be transparent about yes. your craft and your process is like it's a class. It's a class. That, that's amazing. How that is true. I have to say that how how open you guys are of how I mean Thomas on his Twitter feeds will post the uh, breakdown of the episode and how how generous and open you guys are with what? your knowledge is amazing. Huh? <laughs> what the hell are you doing At with Thomas Twitter? <laughs> 
stay off the Twitter. You're going to say another tweet. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, one of one of the most interesting things I actually heard on the podcast. To add to that, Sorry. though, but you know, don't forget, it's it's uh, we have people we answer to. You know, we're, these, this is not this is the, the show is not we don't write these the checks. We, but these guys, but also we don't write the checks for the show, and so it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it, there's a lot of faith coming from uh, Sony and, and from AMC yeah. that we'll figure it out. Uh, you know, you can imagine I can imagine circumstances where. And I've been in circumstances where the, the studio or the network asks, well, you know, this is an interesting first episode, but why don't you give us the arc of the, give it this, not only the arc of the first season, but the, what are the arcs of the second, third, fourth, fifth seasons? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that that's a, it's a, I understand the impulse for that, but the, the problem with that is if you start getting married to some big scheme that you have, you start forcing the characters into yeah. doing things that they, that, that the, the human beings wouldn't do. Yeah. They start, people start doing things because it leads to the next beat rather than it's the, it's the re, it's something that this person, Jimmy McGill would do mm. or Chuck would do. It starts being, okay, we'll do this because we know in episode 204 mm. that Chuck is gonna, is gonna do this and that. And it, it, it's, I, it was a hard lesson for me to learn because I'm Breaking Bad. We would start putting things up ahead of time mm. and, then, and then I would get very excited. Oh, Got the episode with the uh, you know got the episode with the big accident and the break in and I'm going to have all this all these great and then Vince would say you know he's Walt's not ready for that or this is Jesse's not ready for that or or why why would Jesse do this right now and and I think it's by by really being devoted as, as devoted as we can be to to um, where the characters are that, that it kind of leaves the story in interesting places or for instance you know we have Kim uh, who's been thrown in this terrible position at work, through no fault of her own, really. I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but you know, there's, there's one version, there's one version where if we had, you know, if we had just been putting up, putting up post-it notes, we would have said, okay, now Jimmy has to get Kim out of the situation. And we, we said to ourselves, well, Kim is not gonna let Jimmy get involved in this. Yeah. She has that, that line that Anne wrote that I, that great I just line love, I that. love more than, it's one of my favorite things we've had on the show. You don't, you don't, you don't save me. me, I save me. Great line. And, and it's, it's uh, it, she, because nobody thinks that they're a supporting character in life. Yeah. These people all uh, are the protagonists of their own story. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, that's uh, something we try to keep in mind. And I, I, it's, it's something, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm proud of it when, when, when they, when they kind of act on their own like that. Yeah. One of the great things I learned on the podcast, going back to your point, was that you actually changed the finale of season one, or at least the, a scene in season one when you started again, the beginning of season two. Can you talk about that? The, uh, when he, Jim, Jimmy goes, doesn't go back into the car. Right, right. We, yeah, we talked about that for just weeks on end. Uh, that was the episode that Tom wrote and directed. Uh, we, <coughs> we, we just assumed, I think uh, Peter spoke to it a little bit earlier, uh, a little while ago. We just assumed, and it was part of that fear of, of, for me anyway, not to speak for any of the other writers, but we got to get this, we got to get to the, we got to cut to the good stuff. We got to cut to the, we got to get to Jimmy. We got to get to, I'm, I'm sorry, we got to get to Saul. Leave this Jimmy guy, you know, get to the, get to the guy everyone is tuning in for. And, and so we're thinking, we, I think we assumed at the end of season one, well, we got to get to Saul Goodman. He drives off going, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> it was obviously Saul Goodman. That's the kind of thing he would do. Well, it took us weeks, weeks at the beginning of this season to figure out, no, no, the very last thing that we were thinking about doing is the thing we should do, which is that he should take the job. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he didn't take it right in that moment, uh, we, uh, but, but it takes that whole first episode for him to do the thing that he clearly was not going to do at the end of the previous season. And, and, and we did that not to be, not to throw uh, you guys uh, for a loop, not to confuse things, but simply because we thought about it and thought about it, and it, <coughs> that thing Peter spoke to a little while ago, he, Jimmy wasn't ready to become Saul Goodman, and, and this is where it gets really tricky for us and why these questions are so hard to answer. How do you know when he's ready? How do you know when he's not? There's a factor involved, which is that we don't want to see Jimmy McGill turn into Saul Goodman. Mm -hmm. We, the writers, all of us, because we like Jimmy better. I didn't know that going into this. <laughs> I didn't know this going into the job. <laughs> you know, we like we like Jimmy better than what we know of Saul from six seasons, five seasons of Breaking Bad, counting the seasons he was a part of. And 
but you have to, but you, but you want to be, you know, as you were talking about, you want to be organic in your storytelling. You don't want to get inorganic and one thing that will lead you down the garden path of inorganicness, so to speak, is, gee, we really like this character. We want to stick with him as long as possible. That in itself is inorganic storytelling. Mm -hmm. So it's, we don't have an answer how long this thing's going to go, how long it's going to take. We just know that we want to step through the minefield, as it were, as delicately as possible, tell the story as, as, as close to perfectly as we can, and not miss any beats, not miss any tricks, and not, not leave any good stuff on the table. As it were. <coughs> well, I think it's now time for you guys to ask some questions, so please stand up, wait for the microphone to come to you, and I will call on you. So can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. <coughs> so this is where they had the Oscars. This is, yeah. Damn. <laughs> Isn't that fun? It looks smaller in real life. <laughs> you guys yeah. likely won an Oscar. Just think. Think of who was sitting in those seats. I know. Yeah. <laughs> There's all kinds of all right, sweat. Right row? Turn around. You might have hair, little, pieces, little bits of hair from celebrities. Be DNA. So cool. DNA. Skin cells. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm coming from India all the way. My idol inspiration, Lindsay Gilligan. Oh, wow. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I would have watched Breaking Bad around maybe 50, 60 times. <laughs> and I left my job. And I've created a game here. I met the lawyer for, for Breaking Bad. I met the attorney of uh, Sir, and wow. they asked me to approach Sony Pictures Television. I met them too, but they say that I need to have a lawyer or an agent. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had my last uh, few dollars here, so I thought this is the best way I could reach out to, you know, my inspiration. So I got the ticket here and. And this is like a dream, dream wow. come true for me. So, wow. gosh, that's, I don't know what to say. But that, Unfortunately, that's, you probably do need a lawyer or an agent, that, but thank you. <laughs> but, but that's, no, that's, that's very impressive and then very, very, uh, very uh, so, like, flattering. My game, I've got wow. my prototype of the game, which can be, you know, for the app and the <laughs> game and the video wow. game too. So, I'm wow. looking for someone who could get a shot of it. Wow. There. That's beautiful. Look at that. He's, wow, that, yeah. I'm, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure we can, uh, uh, we can, we can uh, put you in touch with someone uh, uh, here. I, I can't, I'm not, not publicly or privately making any promises of anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, well, you but can I'm, just take a look and if you think it's really valuable, <coughs> you could help me out, please. Uh, we, we uh, I, I'm sure there's a, uh, someone in the audience, uh, with the who, yeah. Somebody with, probably somebody with, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jen. All right, who, th this young lady will, will talk to you. Okay, uh, she's, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. And thank you, thank you for, very flattering. Thank you. All right, thank you. Oh, yeah. 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 Sorry, please wait for Mike. <coughs> I like your shirt. Cool shirt, yeah. better call Saul. Available on the... I yeah. love your show. Thank you. Good. Quick question. Why does Chuck have a phobia for electrical and electronic gear? Excellent question. It's not a phobia. It's not a phobia. It's, it's, a, it's a hypersensitivity to uh, electromagnetism. <laughs> An electromagnetic field. Yeah. Uh, he has a phobia of being exposed to it. Just like a person who, is, uh, who was burned in a fire would might have a fear of the fire. But it's, uh, I, I have to approach it as a legitimate uh, medical con condition. And there are people who, who suffer from this. It's a genuine thing. Yeah. And, and as the short answer. Yeah. That's and it was pretty long. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is an excellent answer, because that exa that's exactly where he's coming from. And uh, where, did, where did it come from? Do you, do you remember where we came up with it in the writer's room? I... We made it up. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> From the best I possible think, place. I think then. that's. I, you, you know. What? I don't think we knew it was a real thing. That's that's the that's the that's the embarrassing thing about this. You know, <laughs> the, the, the most. I, I will say this at this point. The most. The question I get all the time as a writer, and and I want desperately to have a better answer every time I get it, is where did this idea come from? Where did that idea come from? It it's. I, I, the writers in the room probably could, could, could back me up on this, all the various writers, uh, including the ones on this show. You just, when you do it for a living, or when you, you don't have to do it for a living, you could do it not for a living. You, when, but when you were a writer, when you, you hoped and pra 
pray they come to you, but you don't know from whence they came right. once you get them. I wish I had a great answer for every time I'm asked, where did this come from? Where did the pie, you know, where did, where did the, the pie sitting? Where did the, oh, that was a group effort. But the, so much of the job is a group effort, by the way. But you just, you don't ever, you don't ever know. You just, you just pray to pray to God or whoever that it, say the idea is don't stop coming. A big, a big, a big part of it. A big part of it is asking yourself the right, the right questions. It's like we have to ask ourselves a lot of questions. And one of the questions that just started is, you know, what if, uh, who, who, who is Jimmy's family? Yeah, you know, we know who we know who Saul is. Who's Jimmy's family? And what if he had a brother? And then we we thought a little bit about. Um, I don't think it's giving anything away. We thought about the movie Crumb. Uh, uh -huh. Where you meet you meet Robert Crumb. And there's a handful of brothers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you meet Robert Crumb. In, in, it's a documentary. It's a, it's oh, a okay. wonderful documentary. Yeah. Right. Robert Check Crumb. Check it out. Yeah. Who's, who's, Harry Swaggle. Who's a genius, and uh, he's very uh, he's very eccentric. And then you meet his brother, who is arguably even more of a genius, mm. but is also you know terribly handicapped by by mental problems and. Uh, I think we, that was that was one of the inspirations we had for uh, for these two brothers. I think absolutely. Mm -hmm. Another question. <coughs> I'm here in the front row. Sorry to make you run over there. Hi. Hi. Um, this question is for Bob and Michael. Uh, on the podcast, you had mentioned that there were two. You each had a scene where you had dialogue, and it was cut. Yours was with Jamie Luner. And yours was the cake uh, after Jimmy got his, uh, his law degree. And there was, there was the cake thing. And neither one of you had seen it without the dialogue yet. And I was just wondering what you thought I don't know which was my scene. I can't remember. Uh, it was um, when you were breaking the breadsticks. Yeah, yeah. And you were thinking oh, yeah. of, the, of the guys that the got their legs is, broken. You, you yeah, so what's your question? At the time. <laughs> um, on the podcast, yeah. when you were when you were both on there, neither one of you had seen those scenes yet, and I was just wondering mm -hmm. what you thought of it without the dialogue. Well, I just love the idea that as much work as Vince and Peter and the writers put into the show, once we shoot it, they stay right on top of it. They still ask themselves, "What have we got here? What's fresh about this? What's what's necessary?" They really just never stop taking it apart and, and making it even better. So it's a really cool thing to see a sequence like that, the one I, I'm in, and go, oh, it's, it works even better without the dialogue and right. just the expressions and the energy of it and the way it's cut. And it's really a great revelation and a joy to work on something like that. Next to him, next to her, sorry. Um, saying as the show is a prequel to Breaking Bad, and you like to pepper in characters from Breaking Bad over the course of the show, and eventually maybe bring in some of the bigger names towards the end of the show, have you thought about secretly filming some of those scenes, knowing that those characters, those people in real life, are aging, and <laughs> and they may not look they may not look oh. as young as they do when Breaking Bad oh, began? That's an excellent question. I mean, it's a funny. It's you got to laugh, but it really is an excellent question. It's no, we, bank, we shoot scenes secretly and bank them until yeah. later. <laughs> the um, good idea. <laughs> you know, there's just it's a great idea. It's just it's it's not not as easy as it, it's a good idea, but but probably not that easy to actually make happen. And a big part of the reason why it'd be difficult, aside from the fact that when we're shooting in Albuquerque, uh, we are we are always taxing our crew to the very limit of what it what it can do. Not on purpose, not because we enjoy beating up on our wonderful crew, but just because we're ambitious and, and we we always we always over schedule and over budget to to the limit, uh, and so it'd be hard to hard to think that far ahead. We get a lot of credit, which I love, uh, and I've inadvertently gone a great length to to deconstruct <laughs> publicly. But we get a lot. I should just keep my mouth shut. But we we get get a lot of credit for thinking. Like Bobby Fisher thinking twenty moves ahead, chess wise. <laughs> if you knew how, how'd that work out for Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> so well, that's a good point. Okay, enough said. I, I wish. You know, it's yeah. funny when you're talking about uh, 
We don't think that far ahead as we well, like to be able we to. We actually, it's interesting because we're actually the opposite of thinking far ahead. We spend more of our time talking about what already happened. Yeah. And yeah. so we would have to think ahead, which would be kind of inimical. However, I will say yeah. there is a scene. This is the first time this has happened, and I don't think this, there's a sequence, a, quite a wonderful sequence, that we shot in season <laughs> one and we didn't use. A sequence actually written and directed by Mr. Schnauz over there. Yeah, and we did bank. We, it's the first time I can remember us oh, banking. Oh, right. Banking. Forgot about that. Uh, and <coughs> you're gonna see it. You'll see it in a couple of weeks. And I, is that the I, one of Patrick coming out of the shower in slow motion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were afraid he would age. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Because we all have the stills. But yeah. <laughs> It's, it's the motion that really gift. makes it work. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It is. <laughs> the, over the, the third row. Yes, head up. Stand up. Yeah, that sweatshirt. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. There you go. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Really my going for the shirts. <laughs> my name is Matthew Ness, and my question is, oh, first of all, thank you so much for um, What's um, yeah. producing some of the best television of all time. Um, my question, my question, there's the idea of uh, Jimmy not being able to resist breaking the rules, and then, so at the beginning of this season, you see him not being able to resist turning off the switch, and then at the beginning of the episode, um, he goes to the alarm, the emergency exit at the Cinnabon, yeah. but he stops and he sits down the whole night, and uh, the next morning he carves SG was here into the wall, so my question is, do you think at that point Saul or Jimmy or Gene uh, is done breaking the rules or do you think he'll end up screwing up or slipping up and going back to doing what he does best? Um, Ooh, that's an excellent, yes. I love the way you worded that. Yeah, I love that attention to detail on that question. Um, <coughs> I think uh, that little bit, that, that apparently was the only act of defiance he could muster, that tiny little SG was here. And it's a pretty sad act of defiance, oh. really. <laughs> Saul Goodman was here. He can't even spell out Saul Goodman. <laughs> but uh, I think the very fact that that tiny ember is still glowing, that ember of defiance, <coughs> uh, that ember of, 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 of uh, if not criminality, that, that, that desire to, to, to walk that path again. I, I, was that safe to say? What, what do you think? I, that's... I think that's a great that's a great interpretation. It's a good it's a good question. I, I, you know, if you had an ability the way Jimmy McGill slash Saul does uh, to see shortcuts and, and find your way through, it would be very hard to resist. It would be like having the ability to levitate and then just say, okay, I'm I'm just not going to levitate because because people will look at me when I levitate. But I, we'll see. I, I think that's a there's, I think it's all bets are off once we get to Omaha. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting thing about the show because there is, we always say it's a prequel, and it is a prequel to Breaking Bad, but the Omaha material is a sequel. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so all bets are off once you get to Omaha. Yeah. Are you on your knees or? Okay. I thought it was like a Toulouse Lautrec thing. Going on. <laughs> <laughs> also, what are you going to say if he is? <laughs> I, I had going to going on a limb. America wants to know. Also, <laughs> Vince, I loved you on Community. Oh, thank you, man. Appreciate that. Right. <clears throat> thank you. That was fun. Great show, Community. Do we have time for one last question? All right, we're going to do one last question. Yeah, they were all in the front. Why don't oh, I know. It just, yeah. I know. I feel bad for the, the runners. It's a, it's all right, there's a woman lady waving in the back. Go ahead. Those there. people are They're really waving. waving. <laughs> all right. Oh. Hi. We'll settle. I'm Kelly. I have some fan pages, Breaking Bad fun facts, and Better Call Saul fun facts. Oh, those are fun! Oh. So my, awesome. Thank you, Ray and Patrick and Michael, for your contributions to my page. My question, Vince and Peter, is on Better Call Saul, you want to make it its own show. And it's difficult when everyone's always comparing it to Breaking Bad, and when are we going to see Walter White and Aaron and all that. So you've had so far Ken wins, which mm -hmm. was awesome, Hector, and uh, Lawson, the, the gun salesman, and then even the tequila made its appearance. 
So yeah. my question to you is, is it difficult or do you have it already in your head on who you're going to be bringing in as cameos? Or it's do you not, have to be careful? You, you do. You, you, know, you know what's difficult? No, it's a good question. You know what's difficult is not overdoing it. That's what's difficult. It, because we love, I think this is a very safe uh, assumption that I can speak for everyone, or certainly for Peter on this, is that we love all these characters and actors from the Breaking Bad universe. Uh, we were so blessed on that show, just as we are on this show, to work with a wonderful bunch of uh, men and women who we love spending time with. The difficulty is to not overdo it. The difficulty is to maintain a certain level of self-discipline so that you don't go willy-nilly and say, you know, let's have uh, this person walk through the background. Let's have this person, you know, get splashed with, with mud as Jimmy drives by, you know. <laughs> and, and it's it's tough, and it's the old Fal oh, Faulkner wait, thing. That's, that's a good one. All right. <laughs> Write that one down. I love that. It's, it's the old Faulkner thing. Sometimes you got to kill your darling. Sometimes we, we had an idea for an, uh, for the final episode of this season, which I, I will not go into, but we had a... I had, okay, you enjoy it. Well, no, I'm going <laughs> to... But I, there was a, oh, there yeah. was a really a perfect opportunity for a cameo that we didn't wind up doing because it would have been... And you guys uh, can figure out what I'm talking about after you see the final episode of, of this season. We had a perfect opportunity, a very organic and logical opportunity for, uh, for someone from our Breaking Bad universe to show up in the final episode of this season, and we didn't do it. And I kind of got talked out of it because I really wanted to do it. And I'm glad I got talked out of it because, as Peter and the other writers rightly told me it would have been distracting and it would have distracted from a very important thing that was going on in that moment. It killed me though. That would have been so great. Yeah. <laughs> and we can't say what it is. Oh. <laughs> You're killing us. <laughs> but uh, but it's 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 fun to but I don't feel a lot of pressure to do it, luckily, and, and part of that's because I'm never on the internet except for to find pornography. So <laughs> but, uh, I don't look up you know, I don't look up Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul or any of that stuff. Not not because I'm not interested. I'm probably too interested, and therefore I've learned about myself. It's better to keep all that stuff at arm's length, and and therefore I don't feel a great deal of pressure. Do you feel pressure? No. I. I you know, it's 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 so the ones the, the appearances you've mentioned have been so rewarding. Yeah. And uh, you saw you guys saw an early look. You've seen before the rest of the world has seen. I think. A huge one with Mark Margolis coming back, but it's uh, it's really just about serving the story. You know, the Ken wins felt very it felt very organic because we you know we have these we have a uh, Jimmy and uh, and Ray ripping off uh, a slick asshole. Well, who's the slickest asshole we've got in our universe? <laughs> Ken wins, and so it felt very it felt very natural. And uh, hopefully, anything we do in the future will. And likewise, seeing uh, seeing Keo Hector Salamanca, it makes perfect sense. Once you've had once you've had the idea of what's going to happen with uh, with Tuco, it makes sense that this guy would show up. So I think what we're, we're hoping to do is to have it be sort of organic, and I th I think that leads to good places. I think so. I hope so. Well, so far it has. It seems a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks to all of you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it very much.